Welcome to Stories That Stick, a podcast series about the stories that shape us. You've got to plant a tree that you're never going to benefit from the shade. Everybody in this society has the ability to work, support and care for someone other than themselves. Hey everyone, it's Ade here, your host for Stories That Stick podcast. And in today's episode, I'm joined by a very special guest, Jay Blades, who is a modern furniture restorer and best known as a TV presenter for BBC hit shows Money for Nothing and The Repairman. Jay joins me over Skype, so yes guys, please do forgive the audio quality because it's not our usual standard. But anyway, Jay joins me over Skype to discuss his career journey to date via his newest autobiography book, Making It, How Love, Kindness and Community Helped Me Repair My Life which is now available at all good bookstores and Amazon. Now, if you're brand new to this podcast, first and foremost, welcome. But please note that we start all our conversations talking about death because we truly believe it helps inform how we choose to live life. And this podcast is a snapshot of the life of our guest through the stories that have not only stuck with them, but made them the amazing people that they are. That being said, If the subject of death does trigger you, then please do skip approximately ahead to the three minute mark or when you hear the page turn in sound effect. And please don't hesitate to get in touch if you'd like to advertise, sponsor or be featured on the show. And finally, without further ado, I bring to you Jay Blades. Okay, we, we, all right, first things first, let me drop you a question and you can just bust a whole load. As a black man to a black man, what do you think? What do you think of the book? In truth, as I was reading it, I was like, you're not that likable of a character, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and in spite of everything, you yeah. do turn out to be lovable. But boy, do I have questions. <laughs> so can we start the podcast? Come on, man, let's do it. Come on, man, okay. I'm ready. Well, welcome to Stories That Stick, Jay. And with all my podcast guests, is I normally start with a subject of death. Okay. How do you feel about it? Um, the day we're born is the day that we're actually going towards our death. So there's a time where you have to do something in between. And within that time, you've got to do something which is your purpose. And I kind of reference it like this, where, you know, if you throw a pebble into a pond and it throws out the ripples, mm-hmm. and as it throws out the ripples, they go to the side. And then sometimes the ripples come back. I'm the pebble that's been thrown into this pond and the ripples go out. But something happened to me the other day that made me realize that I could die now and I would be happy. Oh, really? Yeah. So I mentor a number of young people over the years and stuff like that. And I mentored a young girl called Leanne who's in a group called Little Mix. And Leanne contacted me last year. She said to me, Jay, I'm doing this documentary and I want you to be involved. And then she said at the end of it, I want to start this fund. I want to do something for the black community. And I looked at myself and I was like, you know what? Leanne coming back to me and someone at her stature is kind of like, wow, that's the ripples come back. Yeah, I hear you, Jay. So let's get into your life. And the way I do it usually is within chapters. Okay. Let's go into your first decade, zero to 10. Wow. Wow. Reading your book, I smiled, but I do want them in your own words. I want yeah. you to tell me fun times, good memories during your first decade. And I can prompt you if you need help. Because you don't need to prompt cream, me. Because there's heat strokes. There's, 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 <laughs> there's heat strokes. There's blackberries. There's, there's plums that I didn't even put in there. There's music. There's um, us going away. There's a council estate. There's just everything. So paint the picture for us. Paint the picture. You grew up. Well, I grew up with my mum. Um, we grew up on a council estate in Kaysenoff Road, which is just between Stoke Newton and Hackney. And growing up there gave me an opportunity to experience community. So everybody that was living on the council estate was poor and we were all striving to obtain something. And I remember there was an old lady that used to live at the bottom. She had a ramp outside of her house. Kitty was her name. And she used to give us a little stale biscuit and you're like, pretend to eat it. But it was nice to kick you because she was an elder. Yeah, for sure. And you had the respect, didn't you, for your elders? You had to. You had to have the respect for your elders. It was a case where I remember sometimes you'll be on the street, you'd be mucking about and you get a clap around the ear roll from an uncle that you didn't know was an uncle. Yeah. And he's like, 
tell your mum, uncle, blah, 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 told you like you're mucking about and you're like, you got something to tell me. Where was you today? I, I, would, I went up to Stanford Hill, mum. Yeah, but what did you push down? I, 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 bam, you get something. <laughs> I wanted to just ask more about your parents. Who do you take after, would you say? I take after the man who contributed towards my birth. And the funny thing is, I take after him without even having him in my life. So sometimes you have something within your DNA that you have no control over. Mm. So if you look at the book, there is this kind of pattern that I've gone through with regards to women. And that's where I got from the man who contributed towards my birth. I only take after my mum in the sense that she will go into areas or deal with subjects that she knew nothing about. I'm that type of guy. I'm just kind of like a born hustler. I will go in there, try something. It works simple. Yeah. And I think that is absolutely true. When I was reading yeah. it, one of the fundamental differences as to how you were falling upwards whilst most of us fall downwards is like, you go, sure, why not? I've got nothing else going on. So why Let me not? try a thing. Is that fair? No, that's definitely fair. But when you look back at it now, I never thought it was anything weird to ask these people for something and get it or not get it. I was used to not receiving stuff, so it didn't really bother me. Mm. I never really... Apart from the, the, the school, the secondary school I went to, the only negativity I really got was those racist geezers that were horrible to me. Jay, let's talk more about that then, when you first came into contact with true racism. Now we're officially in your secondary school. So this is from 11 to 20, usually, where education is pivotal or crucial to a lot of people's identity, the upbringing, what they want as a career ambition and just, you know, being a full quote unquote fledged adult. Your secondary school was when you first came into contact yeah. with racism. Yeah. When I went to secondary school, I never knew certain names. I grew up in a council estate, black, white, Chinese, Asian, we're all together. The only thing we had in common was that we're poor. That's it. No one called no one a name. No one took the mickey out of no one. So when I go to secondary school and I get called these names, and I'm like, okay, those are names of endearment. They're being nice to me. Okay, new kid on the block. Nice, <laughs> nice. So then I bring those names back to the hood and I start calling my friends that. And my friends are like, well, well, hold on. Who are you calling that? But you know, you're that as well. I said, yeah, that's what they call me at school. And he's like, no, 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 that's not right. Those are racist names. As a matter of fact, I'm coming to your school tomorrow. Point out these people that are calling you those names. So then I'm pointing them out. I said, there he is. That one, this one, this one. And he beat all of them up. And I didn't basically beat them up. I didn't realize. He doesn't go to my school, so he won't be back there the next day to defend me. I had to defend it myself. But you became very good to the point that you, you started having a rep, right? Yeah. Can I ask, though, in all of this? Because, yeah, <laughs> because, yeah, unfortunately, it is just, you know, part and parcel when you grow up in certain neighbourhoods that you have to, by just nature of survival, become quite good with your feet and your hands, right? Yeah. Feet to yes. run away, hands yeah. if you're back to a corner. But where yeah. was your mum in all of this? Because you never really hear where the adults are in these narratives. I think, especially for me, I would say growing up, my mum was young when she had me, 18. I never hold anything against my mum because at the end of the day, she looked after me with the best of her abilities of what she could do at that particular time. But one of the things I was when I was a young kid, I was quite shy. So no one really knew what was going on with me. I wouldn't really talk that much. Yeah, I was quite withdrawn. Like a lot of people used to think, well, there's something wrong with him, you know, because he don't really speak that much. But when I was out on the street, I had a great time. I had loads of friends, loads of activities was going on. So I remember my mum going to school and saying to the head teacher, if he gives you any trouble, just discipline him. Don't call me back up here again. Like that's the way she dealt with it. It was like, cool. But she didn't know that those teachers had a license to, woo! <laughs> they, they were different. <laughs> they were different, right? I'm telling you, that there was a guy, Mr. Trimble. We had these old plimpsoles. They were black with a rubber sole and had elastic on the top. He took off the material and he used to beat you with just the sole. So you go and see Mr. Trimble now. And I, whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> but no, nah, my man enjoyed it too much. Yeah, speaking of beats, literally like the beat and just the race relations and attention during this era. Oh. The 80s. Yeah. Like a lot of the police back in the 80s, they were told to conduct themselves in a particular way through Margaret Thatcher. It was the sus law. So if you saw a police, 
you wouldn't get good afternoon, sir, or anything like that. You would get stopped and searched. You would either get run down um, because you're suspicious about doing a particular crime. So it was a very hostile environment. I mean, very hostile. Speaking of violence, Blackbeard, to me, is almost like your villain type character. Blackbeard weren't easy. Blackbeard, um, personally, a lot of people in Stokey would know who I'm talking about because this geezer was not easy. You had a group of people that would move to you. They took the law into their own. They are the law. They're the law. Even in today's society, if you look at it, we've had over 100 black people that have been killed at the hands of the police and no one has actually been brought to justice. If you look at the overrepresentation of young black men going from the educational system to the criminal justice system, it's an alarming rate. Yeah. And this doesn't just happen because all black people are criminals. There is obviously an institution or there is a, a way of thinking that you need to police these people and continue to manage these people. And it's been going on since I was young um, and it's still happening today. Sorry for jumping on my soapbox, but I am a community worker. Far from. In fact, yeah. this is why I'm honoured for you to even be on this platform, because we're all about positive role models and just change the negative yeah. stereotypes. And God, you've done that plenty. So let's do move on slightly then, Jay. Here, you wrote in five years of Highbury Grove School, what it did, it killed your innocence and turned you into an angry youth. So you weren't thinking career-wise at all, were you? <laughs> No, I wasn't thinking career-wise. No, not at all. So what happened then next, really? It's, it's basically what happened next was a case of me going to do small, really menial jobs, job, just trying to find my way. And you've got to remember, if Hybrid Grover took him out my innocence as a child, it kind of put something inside of me that I was never going to find that direction because I was dealing with anger. So I didn't know where to direct that anger. I didn't know how to to show my vulnerability. So when you don't have that possibility of showing your vulnerability, what then happens is you internalize a lot of stuff and you then externalize violence. And that's all it was. So I would have a job and then it'll be a case of be violent with someone. Um, I remember working in the sausage factory and this guy was talking to, I think it was Beryl, I can't remember her name, but he was speaking to her a certain way. And I just told her, you need to stop that. She's an old lady. And he's like, you shut your mouth, you black, blah, blah, blah. You don't know. Boom! I just knock him out. I didn't even have time for him to finish the sentence. All I heard was you black, blah, boom! And I just said to Beryl, listen, I'm going to go. This guy's not really going to accept me being here anymore, but you don't need to do this job and it's messing up your health. So I just walked out. But that's how I used to deal with a lot of stuff. Hmm. So what tickled me was when you went to go first see a therapist and then yeah. she said she's choosing to no longer see you because of the violence. What yeah. I didn't understand is, A, who at that time in, of your life, which we're looking at what, we're still in our teenage years, aren't we? I was almost, I think I was about just turned 20. It was when I was in Luton. And that was Stevenage that I went and saw that counsellor. Who um, suggested that? There was a guy that was in Brixton and he was dealing with men's anger and how to communicate a lot better. Because I couldn't get down to Brixton, he actually recommended this woman. And this woman dealt with men's aggression. Mm. And the thing about it, I wasn't coming with no horror movie violence. I was coming with just like fighting. I would get angry very quickly and I would just lash out. That's the way it was. And she just said, no, I can't deal with you no more. And I was like, sorry? She said, I can't deal with the level of violence. And I'm like, but this is what you do. You deal with men's aggression. And then I thought to myself, there's this old saying, Tell a friend to tell a friend, but never beg a friend. So I never beg her. Mm. I never beg her to take me back or anything like that. So I just said, you know what? Okay, I'll move on. Was she black? No, she wasn't black. She was a white lady. Do you think that would have mattered? It probably wouldn't have, black or white. I think, personally, there was something going on with that lady. Something going on. And I didn't really want to get to the bottom of it, because then you would have to get into a discussion around something that had nothing really to do with me. She had a role. She had a job. I came there as a client. She couldn't fulfill that role. And as she couldn't fulfill it, she then told me to go. So it was like, cool, I'm going to go. Nah, I hear that. Well, let's try and then shift somewhat to first figure out how you started getting into community work. Okay. What I've read, and please correct me if I'm wrong, was you and Maria, which was your first baby mum, when things yes. didn't quite work out, you went with Romani? 
Oh, Romani. Is there Romani in the book as yeah. well? Yeah. Okay. Romani. Okay. okay. You moved in with her, which was down in South London. And so she kicked you out. Yeah. And so at 21, you find yourself in Elephant and Castle Salvation Army. And then the yeah. first person who you genuinely felt was sincere. And this guy's name is Michael Arlington. Michael Arlington. I know Michael. He's good people. And he, would you say, was one of the first stepping stones to lead the career and the lifestyle that you do have now? Michael was probably the first one that gave me an opportunity to, to give back. Whereas before, when I was growing up, it was all about taking, taking away someone's dignity, beating someone up to the extent of making them feel little. Whereas Michael was the first person who said, I'm going to teach you how to give back. And I'm going to do it with not wanting anything from you. It's just, I'm going to give you back something. And all the time I'm like, what's wrong with this guy? Why is he giving, why is he so nice? That don't make no sense. I never met anybody nice like this. He must want something. I know, he wants something. And I never sussed that Michael didn't want nothing. It's only when I said to him, you know what? I want to do some volunteering work. He sent me down to a place. I think it was called CVS or CV, CV something. Yeah, you said CVS in the book. Yeah, CVS. And then like they sent me to Oxford. And when you give back to people, especially when you give back to people who are less fortunate than yourself, don't forget, I was homeless. I had nowhere to live. So if someone's less fortunate than me being homeless, it's a real humbling experience. Mm. So I'm working with these guys and supporting them. And I'm like, wow, you're speaking to someone who has no family member, but he's got everything he's got in a plastic bag. That's his life in a plastic bag. And the plastic bag weren't full up, you know. The plastic bag was half, half full. Sorry. No, no, no. But this was the point in the book for me where I'm like, oh, there's actual self-reflection and there's humility in a sense where you literally said it. Yeah. You said, I always thought I didn't give a damn about anyone or anything. I had no idea I had this kindness in me. And it was during the stage when you were having these conversations with those in this hostel, wasn't it? Or like a It was a, a hostel shelter. for homeless yeah. and people with mental mental disabilities. And uh, yeah. there was one particular story, and this made me chuckle. <laughs> there was a gentleman yeah, in this yeah. home that did yeah. something to this nurse. Do you want to, do you want to tell me the story? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, was, it wasn't even him doing it. It wasn't him doing it to the nurse. Well, basically, um, every now and again, there was a young, well, not young, he was quite old gentleman I used to look after him. And he used to drink a lot of tea. And he'd have like four, maybe five, maybe six sugars sometimes in his tea. And he would drink that and it would just block him up. He couldn't wee. So his belly would get big like he was pregnant. But basically, because of the sugar content, it couldn't get through to the penis. It just, just didn't work. So every now and again, he'll get a catheter put in there and they'll let him go toilet. The baby on the bag and his belly will go down. And we'd do that in a couple of months' time. So this time, man, I normally you sit by him when you get this catheter put in. What's a catheter, just for those who don't know? A catheter is like a, a tube that goes up the eye of the penis where the wee comes out and it goes up into the bladder and it opens up a, like a balloon pumps up and then the bladder then allows the wee to come in down this tube and into this bag, yeah? Mm. So I'm like, many a times I've sat next to him and I've, he's been smoking a cigarette and we drink a tea and he's just talking to me like normal, like, yeah, 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 blah, 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 Jay, yeah, we're going to put a bet on the horses later on, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. So this time now I'm sitting there, he's drinking his tea and I'm, I'm having a cup of tea and he's like, ooh, ooh, you can see him really winching. I said, you're all right, what's going on? He's like, it's hurting. I said, it never normally hurt. So I look at the nurse now and the nurse's like, oh, I forgot. She forgot to put the KY gel on. So she whips out this catheter, yeah? Just whips it out. And then he just starts weeing. I mean, like, it come out like an <laughs> elephant. It was like, <laughs> and I'm looking at him. I'm looking at this nurse. And it's just like, all, and I mean, it's hitting her out of force. Like you, it, it, it's unreal. The way it's hitting her was just like, oh. wow. And then I looked back at him and I was like, he started laughing. I started laughing. And it was the funny, the only person who didn't find it funny was the nurse. Because the piss was uh, strong. I mean, the piss had its own postcode. You know what I mean? Oh, it was say that no more, strong. Say no more. <laughs> but I saw some stuff in that. that I think it was really humbling. Really, really mm. humbling. Yeah, it was really beautiful in what I learned there. I made some really good friends. And one of my friends I'm still friends with to today. It's just, yeah, yeah beautiful. Yeah, no, I hear that. So help us out then. Now are we thinking that we've got purpose? And all this while was money never, because it doesn't seem like money is your driver. It doesn't seem no. like you'd care much for money. 
I don't even care about money now. Oh, uh, really? Money will come. That ain't a problem. But your purpose, your actual legacy or your direction, that's more important. So when I used to speak to young people and I'm doing community work with them, I said, to them, you don't have to be an MC. You don't have to be this type of person to make it. You could be a manager. You could be the accountant. You could be the person that deals with the finance behind the actual camera. That means that you have got a strategic way of making sure that you're economically independent. And that's one of the biggest things that we need to instill in the youth. I think Getz, I listen to Getz a lot, and Getz put it like this, that he don't hear other rock stars or whatever comparing numbers or acting in a certain way with each other, always fighting. I grew up with reggae. And when I grew up with reggae, reggae is very uplifting. I listen to people like Alton Ellis, John Holt, Bob Marley. When you listen to these guys' words, they're not talking about belittling each other. They're talking about uplifting. So where have we gone wrong? And it's not where we've gone wrong. For me, it's who you're listening to, right. who you allow to control your narrative. If they're controlling your narrative, they will allow you to say things that will fit their narrative of the stereotypical role that you're supposed to fit into. Sorry, that's not me. I'm not doing it. No, that. for sure. That's yeah. why it's important to have you in the limelight. And I'm really grateful for you even choosing our podcast, a very small podcast to even be featured on because you believe and you know it to be important. So I'm here for that. It's very important. Your, your podcast might be small, but at the end of the day, it's a very important podcast. I want people to understand that no matter how small a podcast is, no matter how small an organization is, they have a dream that they're trying to achieve. And the only way sometimes they can achieve it is by people stepping back and coming back to those organizations. You should be able to reach out to all of these celebrities. And if they have a heart, if they have the community at their kind of fundamental, they should step back to you. Full stop. I don't care. I hear so many stories where certain individuals have made it and certain people know those people. They've reached out. They never look back. Not me, man. No, I appreciate that, Jay. I truly do. Yeah. Well, then let's get into how you're doing it. But I think we need to just tie some more, like, well, we need to join a couple Loose more ends. dots to really get you into where we find <laughs> you sitting because a lot of us would know you more for being on TV rather than yeah. any of your community building, any of the things from street dreams to out of the dark to even, well, police and the police. I mean, you never in a million years would have thought you'd have got there, right? So never. this all happened whilst also doing a sort of philosophy stroke criminology degree this is wild <laughs> like i keep on saying that the more i was reading your book i'm like how is he just falling upwards <laughs> <laughs> i love that terminology and i'm probably gonna have to make that falling upward where we would start is with jade i was studying criminology and philosophy at uni and i met jade during a basketball session and I see Jade there bouncing the ball. And she could move. I was like, well, because of my old ways, I, I, certain girls get my attention. That's just the way it was. They get my attention. But then we became friends, started talking. And we just started discussing how we can make the world a better place. She had come from Turkey and seen a lot of injustice over there and was basically along the same lines as me. And I would speak to her for hours. And she articulated everything that I did and put it into a format that is presentable to people that could give you funding. Mm. When we got a chance to do some work with the Thames Valley Police, Dave McWhorter then asked me that I would like to have my police force police the communities that you're representing a lot better than they're being represented now. And all the young people I've spoke to over the years, there's a few that disagree with this statement, but the majority of them want their area to be better. Mm. They don't enjoy living a life of crime. They don't enjoy the violence. Because when I was in that environment, I know I didn't enjoy it, but I didn't have anybody giving me a sense of direction, purpose, or getting something that I'm in tune to that can actually allow me to make that change. And that's all I was doing. I instigated that with Jade. Dave McWhorter was the star, and then it just, it just smashed it. We smashed it. Everything we done, we smashed it. It was like, what? It, it, genuinely, <laughs> it genuinely sounded like that. It didn't seem like there was any quote-unquote lost causes. But, no. Jay, everything wasn't sweet, though. Let's not be around the bush, especially when it came down to your relationships, right? No, it wasn't sweet. I, I think my relationships, if you've read the book, and the sad state of affairs is this. Um, sometimes you go through something at life and you don't know why you're going through it at the time. But it's only when you come out of it and you're able to reflect and you're able to look respectively at what it is 
then you realize what you went through is what you needed to go through. So my ex-wife, Jade is someone I hold very dearly to my heart because if it wasn't for her, one, I wouldn't be speaking to you. Two, I wouldn't have this book. Three, I wouldn't probably be on TV. But the relationship that I have with Jade now is probably, not probably, is better than I've ever had. Yeah, she, she's there for me now and I'm there for her now. So with Jade, we're now yeah. speaking about Out of the Dark. And you, again, still had yeah. that very community element where you wanted to bring in the youths to teach them how to fundamentally make money out of nothing, quote unquote. Definitely. Because there's no one better to mentor a youth than a youth who they look up to. Um, so our philosophy was to work ourselves out of a job. So with that in mind, when funding started drying up because of the crash, it was a case of, okay, how can we get our own revenue to continue working with these young people? And it was a case of coming up without a dart. Now, when Jade first came up with it, I didn't really buy the idea. I was just like, you know what? Who's going to buy secondhand furniture? Who wants to buy that stuff? We're buying it at a cheap price. We're fixing it up. Like, really? It was only once we was in this magazine. I think it was the Architectural Digest. And someone had bought this sideboard in Italy and was wrapping this up to get sent out to Italy. I'm like, I better study this, you know, because there's, there's, something, <laughs> there's something she knows about this that I don't really know. So I started studying. I started looking at furniture. I started understanding, like, okay, who do I need to team up with? It's kind of like brand association. So I looked at fabric houses. I looked at wallpaper. I looked at different bloggers, furniture stores, what they were selling it for, how much, et cetera, et cetera. I'd done my research, and then I went to town. So I met some really important people. I met Sir Terence Conrad. I met Sean Sutcliffe. These are big players in the world of design and whatever. And they were impressed with what I was trying to achieve. They're just like, wow, you're trying to teach these youth about design and you come in, you're saving the planet as well by making sure this stuff that doesn't in the landfill. Of course, we're going to support you. And I had some people around me that, pff, unbelievable. And yeah, that's I'd say that. Didn't you worked. even have a business deal with heels at a time? Yeah. It wasn't even a business deal. It was nothing to do with business. What it was to do with is the big corporate giving back. Hills turned around and said to us, we would have your stuff in the store for the amount of three months. We'll give you a front window. Yeah. Three months you can have your stuff in there. Wow. And we don't want any money from what you sell. I said, excuse me? We don't want any money. Everything you sell will go straight back to you. And I still have a relationship with Hills to this day because they are, and Sean Suckler, everybody that I've had a relationship with without the dark, still have a relationship with them. So let's tie this up because I am now acutely aware of your time, Jen. I'm really <laughs> grateful. So I know from Hills, no this is a situation where you did a workshop for them. And then within that workshop, there was a lady who approached you who worked for TV. Yeah, the TV career happened through one, through Katie, um, who contacted me after doing a workshop with me and said she would like me to be part of Curse the All Sorts Handmade Fair. She just started this new kind of festival. It's all about handmade. So we did that. Um, but where it really catapulted um, the TV career was the Guardian newspaper came and they contacted Jade and said, oh, we want to do a film of you guys. So I was a bit dubious, first of all, because I'm like, well, the Guardian newspaper, they do newspapers. What are they doing a film for? Mm. Jade said, don't worry about it. They'll come down. The guy needs five days. He's going to film. We do cool. No problem. So he comes down the first day. There's no camera. So I'm like, okay, he's probably casing out the joint. Da, 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 da. Next day comes down. Day two. He comes with no camera. So I have to speak to Jay because she was upstairs. So, He's got no camera, you know. She's like, no, no, don't worry. He's going to have a camera. It's all going to be fine. Don't worry. So then the third day comes and the geezer comes. He's got no camera. So I'm like, <laughs> go see Jay. I said, Jay, listen, someone's having us on. This man ain't filming nothing. And she said to me, ask him what's going on. So I went downstairs and I said to the geezer, I said, you come to film us? Said, yes. And I said, well, where's your camera? You ain't got no camera. He said, what I need to film hasn't happened yet. I was like, whoa, you are confident. I was like, listen, Richard, you ain't seen it hasn't happened yet. There's a lot of stuff going on. He said, no. And he was a French guy. And the way he said it to me was just so, it was so romantic. You couldn't say nothing back to the guy. It was the, I didn't even understand what he said, but it's just like, you know what? I hear what you say. The next two days, he came with his video and he filmed his video. That basically went viral. The Guardian newspaper was contacting us and saying, look, your video is racked up like something stupid, like 50,000, then it went to 100,000. But what happened on the back of that 
was all these TV companies started contacting me. So you had the likes of um, the guys that done Money for Nothing, the guys that now do uh, Gogglebox, Studio Lambert. We had Richard Branson's son, who's got a production company. We had Potato. We had this. We had all of them knocking on my door. But Jade said, no, I don't want him to do that. I want him to do certain things, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. And I'm quite glad she held out in that way because it probably would have been a different story. Um, mm. And Money for Nothing found me, got me as an artisan on their first two shows. And then in the third series, they wanted me as a presenter. So I'd done presenting with Money for Nothing for, I think it was three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I'd done it for seven series. And in that time, the repair shop came knocking as well. But yeah, here I am now. Amazing. Let's do wrap up. And with stories that stick, if there's one thing you can almost leave mm. as a part in, check this out or do do this. I think what everybody should be doing is to influence people they're never going to meet. So there's an old saying that, You've got to plant a tree that you're never going to benefit from the shade. Everybody in this society has the ability to work, support, and care for someone other than themselves and not look to receive something. That's what we should be doing. But read my book. There's a change coming. Amazing. And how do we find you? Social media, Instagram is the best thing. I do all of my own social media. But my social media is always about giving back. There's no real message apart from Read the thought of the day. Learn about the historical black figures that have made a difference in the British society. Um, everything I'm doing is all about educating others to then educate others to then educate others. That's it. But read the book. There's a change coming. 100%. For those of you who are listening, please do pick up the book, Jay Blades. It will be available 13th of May. 13th when it's of coming. May. But guys, again, I'll put all the links in the show notes. And yeah, watch this space because, again, it's a great read. It was so much fun to read and even more fun to speak to the man himself. So, Jay, thank you very much for your time. Really and truly appreciate it. Thank you, sir. And I do hope there'll be another thank occasion you. where we do get to chop it up once again. Yeah, there will be. I'm going to be making history. Amen. I'm going to jump on your back and hopefully you can help me fall <laughs> upwards as well, Jay. <laughs> Don't Bring. worry, man. You're there, man. You're there already. You're there. Uh, well, I hope you yeah. have a good week. Yeah. And thanks once again. Thank you. Sir. Take care. You if you enjoyed today's episode, please do share it. And if you'd like to be featured on the podcast, please do get in touch.